great. I'm, I'm thrilled to be there today to present you the work we've been doing. And this time, I'll try to do something really different in the context of putting everything, all the different things that we've been doing together was on creating trust in translational research platform with all the different components that are integrated to make this happen for real. As a disclosure, I'm consultant for Clitas Genomics, and I'll be it on just one slide. Where Case did a great uh, presentation keynote yesterday, and uh, I agreed on everything he said, I just would add one element. With the translational research platform, the users are not just the customers, there's also principal investigators from academia. Then I think that's something extremely important to distinguish and to make sure that we don't forget. A customer will have a direct contract to, with someone in order to do the enhancement and to do the job. A principal investigator, when he will be using an open source tool, he has to trust it because he can't have the resource to do any development, to do any quality check and all this. So what we want is really to make sure that also not to forget the principal investigators, to trust using Transmart in their grant application as the database to integrate all the data so that they'll be able to go and do their work, but they need to create a trust to reuse this, this system. So the creating trust for who? For the users, the patients, developers, the institutional review boards, and whatever name in your country, the lawyers, CEOs, to be able to make the impact of reusing the system. So my presentation will be uh, separated in all these different chapters on the data integration analysis and analysis to have something patient-centric, sharing the code and the data on the scalability, reality, compliance, and also on the big data question. So first of all, trust on the data integration and analysis. That's Every time I'm presenting Transmart and showing it to someone, that's their view. It's a black box saying, well, you want to take my nice data, which is in blue as being the best of the world. For him, it's the best quality. Then you put it in your box, and then I have no idea what's coming out of it. In this process, there's three different steps. One is the ETL. Extract, transform, and load. To put into the step number two on how to, in, to store it, to integrate it, and then number three, how do, do you extract this data to run the analysis? And we all have in mind all the different steps that are present in Transmart, where you can, there's all this ETL process, you store it, and then there's different tools to analyze it. When you want to make sure that Transmart, and as I'll be talking, I to be to Transmart, is not this black box. It's not just about the box on itself, but also on the arrows to make sure that you have the three decision steps which are with quality controls on every single step. And that's how we got, and I'll be talking about it, HIPAA compliance, because every single step is now documented. So what we really want is to have all those different elements that are available for the investigators for the developers, for the security officer in the institution to trust using this kind of platform. The very first use case I had of using Transmart was at the Pompidou Hospital, where I asked one of the investigators, can you give me your raw data and one published study with, please, not a lot of patients, not a lot of variables, because I had to check everything my, uh, myself. So I really wanted something extremely small. This study only had 173 patients and 20 variables. Easy. What was it about? On the, and to be very clear, this study was already published when I accessed the data. I wanted the PDF of the publication in a high journal and the raw data to be able to do this validation of all three steps, one, two, and three. And not just three of the analysis, it's also on how to integrate the data, how it's stored. And so, it's on the cascade of metastatic colon cancer. So we had the clinical data and biological data that we integrated to be able to make a biomedical discovery. So how does it look like? We had, we integrated this study within this ontology tree where you can see that there's data on biomarker, BRAF, KERAS, and RAS, 
in a folder called mutation detection, in a folder called nonomic, in biomarker data. How do you integrate? How do you go up to this on integrating your data in Transmart? That's the raw data, the exact raw data that was used for this study. One line per patient, one column per fact. We all recognize this as we have this kind of data set. And we have on the column number one, the subject ID. Number two, the se second column, the age, sex, and then Keras, Beraf, and Ras. How to integrate this within Transmart is to be really, and that's an amazing job that was done by the, uh, uh, even before, the, by recombinant when, uh, when it became open source, on creating a full documentation on how to load the data within Kettle and to create your mapping file to show that you have those different columns from the data file. Column number one, subject ID, number two, age, number three, CX, and then the mutation. Where is all the magic of integrating all the data within the I2B2 table of Transmart? is to have here the category code where you have biomarker data, nonomics, mutation detection, the plus are the yellow folders because they're the same, everything is put together. So it's really, and I show this to every single investigator. Why? Because then they're all trusted. They, they won't see it as a black box, they will understand, okay, there's no ma there mustn't be magic. You have to have a really straight, straightforward integration. And I always I show this study because it's a very simple one coming on having Keras, Beraf, and Ras integrated within those three folders uh, and available in the platform. Then, once the data was integrated, we were able to do a survival analysis, and that's the survival analysis we got using the R script in Transmart, directly out of the box, and that's the published figure in Journal of Clinical Ontology, which was the main outcome of this study. And it's by repeating these kind of use cases of an easy win that will make the trust of people of using it because you can show that all three steps worked and not just one of them. Another study we did was and to integrate because the data we have around patients where you have a certain number of patients, certain time, and number of variables. That's the context of big data where you have those three different axes. The second study we integrated was on the same number of patients, but you have additional variables describing it, and most important, more time to be able. And so how did we do this is from the high 2 b 2 database in Pompidou Hospital, where we had 30 years of history, we had patients with also a very small number of patients, only 60 patients, that went through and had an neck surgery, and that were followed within a study for 32, 32 months. During the time of this study, this is the time over 30 years, we had a time period where we had much more phenotype data on those patients, but this study was on reusing this clinical data. What we did is to make the link with the longitudinal data in the I2B2 database, with the structured data from this research study, to be able to do phenotypic augmentation. The main outcome was of the paper, with, which was without the I2B2 data, only the 32 months, to see the survival analysis of the patients with a biomarker PD-1, 1 versus high versus low. That's the figure published in this uh, journal. We were able to replicate this directly from the user interface, but most importantly, by adding the I2B2 data, we added additional time of survival or death on those patients to show that you could do augment the number of phenotypes on those patients. So everything we've been doing was really on integrating all the data into one central system, one central database, taking the analogy of Google Map, where we all have on our iPhone in production all those layers of information working, satellite postcode code and even the traffic jams. Why, and what we did was the I2B2 Transmart framework to integrate everything into one central system. So the way we use it is to have the integration of all patient-level clinical, biological, and omics data in one place, and this integration being hypothesis-free, to be able for investigators to generate hypotheses directly by the, using either the interface or by connecting directly to the database. Then, when I arrived at Harvard two years ago, I was asked by my boss, Zach, to integrate all the data he had on autism. So the 16,000 different patients with longitudinal EHR data, with multiple research cohort, biobank, patient consent, and 
gene expression, SNP, all exome sequencing, RNA-seq into one central system using I2B2 Transmart with two main use cases. The first one, generation of hypotheses by investigators by being able to touch directly the data by doing the queries. And number two, to do high throughput analysis by having direct access to the database. Because for example, if you want to do a GWAS, you want to do one million drag and drop, you need to connect directly to the database to do high throughput analysis. And I'll show you multiple examples. So the data we integrated within this first study on autism was multiple research cohort, Simon Simplex collection, 11,000 individuals, where it's a quad family, and you'll see this, where we have the per band affected autism kid, and all the data on mom, dad, and unaffected sibling, as being a quad family, everything integrated within the database, and multiple other research cohort that were integrated. What we wanted is to have any kind of big data being available within this platform. So we integrated RNA data with all those different samples. At the DNA level, we wanted any functional re unit resolution available to be queryable from the user interface. So we started by the 6,000 SNPs integrating, integrated within the I2B2 Transmart framework and all exome sequencing data on all those different uh, um, patients. So what we integrated, to be very clear, it's not the FASQ file or the BAM file. We, those, we leave them on the server. What on the, on, the, on the file server, what we did is we integrated the VCF, so v after the variant calling file with the annotation, within the I2B2 database to have the same database model than the phenotypic data. The big question is, will this be scalable when we'll have we'll be doing all genome sequencing, when we'll be doing having tens of thousands of different samples. We don't know yet, we are testing it, we are testing on scalability to be able to see how far we can go, and I'll be talking later on on the uh, other um, uh, storage with, that we'll be using. The use case I'll be showing you is on autism patients. When pay, what has been described is when you have a CHD8, the gene CHD8 mutation, then you have a bigger head circumference. You can see here the head circumference with all the patients with a CHD8 mutation, and they have a bigger head circumference, as you can see here. On, so it's data from those patients that we'll be querying. And so I'm only showing one element from the demo. The full demo is al already available on YouTube. What I really wanted to show you is how we can integrate all those different data types. So for example, the mutation, the curated mutation on CHD8, those eight patients drag and drop with the, the patients that do not have this mutation and then generate summary statistics. This is running live, it wasn't pre-computed. So comparing CHD8 mutated in red versus CHD8 non-mutated in blue, comparison of age, sex, and race. Now looking at the phenotypic data, which is not just on the 2,600 per bands, it's on all the family. So do I, I'm now I'm looking at Simon Simplex commonly used variable. So there's 10,000 clinical variable in per patient in this data set. So now I have, for example, the height of those patients, drag and drop, what will happen is I'm now comparing and doing a t-test on the height of patients with CHD8 mutated in red versus CHD8 non-mutated. You can see that with the mutation they are taller, 146 centimeters, compared to 135 centimeters. Is this statistically significant? Transmart helps you and say, telling you with the p-value and the t-test, this is not significant. The results are not significant, one-on-one -on -one statistics, to tell you that there's a difference, but it's not significant. If instead now, instead of taking the height, I'm taking the head circumference, drag and drop, you'll see that it's 56 versus 53, and the p-value 0.01. So we are able to reproduce results. That's the whole idea of having those use cases coming from published results. And so what we also de uh, developed is to the integration of the family relation. In genetic studies, you have, and that's the whole purpose, where we have all exome sequencing data on all the family, we need to be able to query on this structure. 
and using the modifiers from the I2B3 database model, we were able to add those elements within the query interface. So for example, making a very simple query, look comparing the age of the individual between and looking at the role, I'm going to compare data from the father compared with the data from the proband. Proband one, and there can be a proband number two because there can be two affected individuals. And so you can have here father versus proband. And now the family relation, that's what I was explaining about. We need to integrate complex phenotypic data of having, it's not just one data point per individual. We need to make relations between those data points. So family relation is a father of, and we added here, relation between subset one and, one and two. Fa the father is the father of this individual. Generate summary statistics, which is just making the query, and I didn't put any phenotypic data, because by default you have the age. But I could do it of any kind of phenotypic data, of course, or a mixed data, to be able to do this comparison. And then, what you can see, which is good news, is the age of the probands are younger than the age of the father. <laughs> so, the, and the integration of all this complex phenotypic data is extremely important in your different study and to be able to, well, something I all, uh, from all those genetic relations. So what we also integrated was having the consent. At the end of the day, the most important phenotype is really the consent on the patient. Now I'm logging in within Boston Children's behind the firewall where we have here the same salmon co simplex collection but also all the EHR data from the 16,000 different individuals with all the drug prescription, the lab tests, that are available in the same way to do the query. And something extremely important is the consent. So what we created using D3 and overlap diagram to be able to compare those data set, if I compare all the patients that had at least one phenotypic variable of Simon Simplex with the patient that have an expression array available, 101 patients in, in common, looking at the consent where within we integrated the consent of those individuals. This was as easy of integrating, it's an Excel sheet of what the patient consented, which you have all these, did the patient agree to be part of a new study? Did they want to be recontacted for the, an incidental finding? Here, there's, there's no magic, it's just of integrating the data that you have, but that which is was sitting on only one Excel sheet on the person doing the inclusion. The idea is to integrate all your different kind of data into one central place. So, consent at a high level, I take now the old folder, how many patients do you have to be able to do a new further study? 96 patients where have phenotypic data, a mix gene expression data available already, and the consent to be able to do a new study. It's really about integrating all those different elements together. And I won't go through in the context of time, but we also integrated the full VCF and the all exome sequencing data within this database model that you'll, you'll find on YouTube a demo on this system. So what I also wanted to talk about was the fact that it's great to have the user interface, but you won't be able to generate, you can only generate uh, hypothesis. You won't be able to run all your statistical analysis. So there must be, you must have a way to do high throughput analysis by connecting to the same database. And taking the, ex I'll show you multiple studies that some of them published some uh, that are still unpublished uh, on, for example, the first one, running a phenome-wide association study where a FIWAS is the opposite of a GWAS, where the starting point of a GWAS is cases versus control, and you look at the systematic difference on the genome. With a FIWAS, the starting point is the genome, where you compare between a certain loci to compare creating two groups, and then you'll be comparing the systematic difference within the phenome. And that's very easy to do once you have all your data integrated within your database. So we did it on... TPMT enzymatic activity in pharmacogenomics. Why? 
because we had all the data being already integrated within the I2B2 database from the Pompidou Hospital. And then we had on all those patients the TPMT enzymatic activity and the TPMT gene status. So what's known from the literature is if you take on the patient that have inflammatory bowel disease, when you take a tuperin drug, you must do either the enzymatic activity or the genetic test of TPMT to know what is your level. If, because if you don't have any or TPMT or very low activity, then this will increase the dose of the toxicity and can be lethal. So what's known in the literature is there's three groups. Normal activity, you take one hundred the full drug, if you have an intermediate activity, you decrease the dose. If you have a low activity, you ma only must take 10% of the dose. What was unknown was here a fourth category. And using I2B2 Transmart, we managed to discover this. How? By creating multiple groups of looking at the enzymatic activity of very high versus normal, intermediate, and low, creating two subsets, two, and then this wasn't done from the user interface. This use case. This was done by connecting directly with our statistical tool directly to the Oracle database to do this half throughput analysis. What we discovered was, and that's the main result, is when you compare very high activity versus normal, intermediate, and low, creating two groups. So all the patients have IBD. And this is a Manhattan plot showing all the phenom, so all the ICD-10 groups compared and the p-value of the association. What does it mean? It means that those patients, very high versus all the other ones, have anemia above Bonferroni and also diabetes mellitus. It means that those patients are not treated enough. Why? Because they're taking 100% of the drug, but still they are still bleeding due to the disease. So it's not an average drug reaction. It's the fact that they should increase the dose of the tuberin drug, which is something that no one would be doing because it, this drug is so dangerous. So what happened is when we showed those results to the, the gastroenterologist with whom we were collaborating, she started to realize I knew that, that some of her patients, were the drug wasn't e uh, effective. But she never made the association of, the, of the, the genetic peak testing. That's the case of doing high throughput analysis on the data. This study only took 15 days to conduct. Why? All the data was already integrated. Why did we start to look at TPMT enzymatic activity? Because I look at all the genetic testing I had available, and that's why I had the most number of patients. I had nothing to do with this disease before. So it's, and then I contacted the, the team, that, uh, the gastroenterology team and the biochemistry team. When I started to explain what I wanted to do, they said, yeah, fine, you can have access to, the, you can use our data. And then they said, oh, well, I already have your data, but are you agree that we work on that? Yeah, have fun. And then when I showed them the result, now they started to get really, 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 really excited. Where this was a first study that was able to replicate by itself because what's the quality of using an ICD code to say that a patient is bleeding or having diabetes mellitus? Why diabetes? Because they were too, taking too much corticotherapy because the treatment wasn't effective enough, the choperin drug. We were able to replicate on the same patient using another data type, using the lab values. We had millions of lab values on those patients. So we looked at the lab value of the uh, hemoglobin level, which was decreased, and hyperglycemia, which was more important. This was, it only took 15 days to conduct. It took months to get the paper approved, but just to do this study, so we were able to replicate, so to have a nice way of integrating the data, because it was done once. So this example of this study is the step one and two that was done for once up front, and then we created the code to do only the, free, the step number three that didn't exist yet to reanalyze the data in a certain way. Another study we did on autism this time at Harvard was to use the same model but using not just ICD code but complex phenotypic data from the Simon Simplex, the one that I showed you, to be able to do this same kind of analysis of doing a phenome-wide association study. And we discovered on eight significant genes above Bonferroni and you can see the cuckoo plot that we made also available, that th there's links between known uh, genes of, for example, dirk one a that where there exist association with microcephaly and febrile seizure above here FDR and febrile seizure even above the Bonferroni, what was unknown and discovered here to find abnormal gait issues 
which is above here the FDR were, and because we did a systematic analysis on the data so that's the whole purpose of the full integration of all the data into one central instance another study that just got published in drug safety was to use also the I2B2 Transmart framework to do high throughput computational analysis using the step three of creating code to be able to analyze your data systematically to find drug-drug induced interaction inducing an acute kidney injury. Finding an adverse drug direction is hard, but finding drug-drug interaction that induce an adverse drug direction is nearly impossible to do for a medical doctor because he can't test all the hypotheses within his mind. Because he can't, even if he saw them. So the idea was to do high throughput computational analysis on the whole database, on testing the all possible combination from real data of 25 years of history from the Pompidou database. This study took one month to create the R script to be able to analyze the data, to be able to discover put hits of potential that need to be replicated, of course, where there's an elevation of the creatinine level with the association of two. So it's really about generating hypothesis. The second point I want, which is, I think, really important, is to have the patient trust. And one of the way of getting their trust is to have study being uh, governed and really governed by patients. And that's something the PECORI, Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute initiative in, uh, in, uh, in the US, created in order to create a central way for a, a new funding agency, which is in parallel than the NIH. For the past three years, they've been giving out half a billion dollars of research funding to have investigation being governed by patients. One of them is the PecoriNet network, $105 million across 18 months, where there's 29 sub-projects, 11 CDRNs and 18 PPRNs. CDRNs are multiple hospitals putting their data together to, for example, the one at Harvard, there's 16 hospitals, and 18 PPRNs is patient-powered research network where it's governed. The PI is has to be PI or PI has to be a parent or a patient. So within our PPRN, where I'm co-PI of one of those PPRN, the PI is a mom where her daughter Shannon, 14 years old, has a very rare condition called felin magdamine syndrome, where there's only 1,100 cases diagnosed worldwide, not more than that. Where it's called the 23Q13 deletion where it's a deletion of the end of the chromosome 22, taking the gene chunk free, and looking at the data on the genotypic size of the deletion of the patients that they have, that's the chromosome 22, so that's the long arm, and you see the, the size in red of the deletion of all the patients that we have in the registry that I'll be talking about. For 147 patients, one line per patient, and you can see that the size is completely different per patient because it's a random deletion of the end. And what's really at the end of the chromosome right here, nearly at the end, is the chunk free gene, which is always deleted within the syndrome. That's the definition of it. And something important is within the size of the deletion, it doesn't take just the gene chunk free. It takes up to 140 other genes up front. So what was interesting in this study is we have a high heterogeneity of the genetic material from this alteration of the patients on one side. On the phenotypic side, there's a very high level of heterogeneity of the phenotypes where nearly all the different organs can be affected except the liver. So they, and mainly they have autism, intellectual deficiency, epilepsy, and small phenotypic defects. What we did within this project was to integrate the data they had from a rec, the, uh, from their rare registry, which was online and entered by the parents, which is a patient-centric registry. That's what they created before us. And what we wanted to do, what we did within this project, is to ask all the parents to give us access to all the clinical notes on those patients. Because the data they collect on this registry is 1,300 registry questions. That's great, but there's not everything. You can't have everything within a registry. That's the, always the limit. So in the context of big data on having a lot of knowledge on those patients, it's, and what's even amazing, it's the, those parents that contacted us 
because they had the idea of saying, we want to extract the data that is sitting on all the clinical nodes, which are all around the states, all around the world. How can we integrate everything into one central place and make this data available for researchers to help to find a cure for their, parents, for their, their kids? So the PDF we received is one PDF from one page up to the biggest one we have up to now is 2,400 pages for one PDF, where there's an, an amazing amount of data. And so what we integrate is to use natural language processing to extract this knowledge, to link it to all the registry data and to integrate it in I2B2 Transmart and to make it available for investigators and also with the Shrine network to make the link with multiple I2 other institutions in order to be part of this network. So in the context of this big data, so it's not it's big data not related to number of patients, but related to number of time where we have all the history and the number of variables because we have all the medical concepts extracted from all the clinical notes. So the big data is really on those three axes and this one is not on the number of patients. It's really about variables and time on those patients. So we use an Apache component called CTEX, so which is an amazing tool created by Savannah Gagana at Boston Children's Hospital. And she managed to get it in the Apache community two years ago, where it's uh, up to today one of the best natural language processing tool for medical uh, texts working in English. She's working hard to have it in Spanish, early pilots to have it in French. And so the idea is to be able to extract the knowledge, for example, family history of obesity, but not family history of coronary heart disease. Extracting this knowledge, if you ex only extract the concepts, for example, obesity, and not the fact that it's family history or the fact that it's a negation, so if you don't store this metadata, it's a non-starter. There's 20% of negation in medical, in clinical notes. You must be able to store and query this complex data type in order to be able to use it. So what we did is to extract all this data, but we wanted to have it as high quality as a research cohort data. So in order to make this, we extracted and then we projected in all the different standard ontologies and we wanted to make it available for investigators so that they will trust using it. And so that's the second demo I wanted to show you. where we have reintegrated so all the registry data on those patients, which is right here. But what I wanted to show you and to focus is on the clinical notes. So the output of the natural language processing, so this is using Transmart 1.0 version Harvard because there's still I2B2 like to into it because I needed to have the modifiers, the complex data type in order to do the query. Otherwise, I couldn't, I couldn't use it. So we have document count, 465 documents, patient count, 155. So here I'm showing you 465 PDF that was automatically extracted and projected in SNOMED, Human Phenotype Ontology, MeSH, Gene Ontology, ICD-9, ICD-10. And there's no limit in the number of ontology you can extract. You can go into the i2b2.bioportal website or even just bioportal and any of the 460 ontologies can be integrated here very easily. So looking at SNOMED, where an investigator will say, oh, SNOMED, I don't know SNOMED, but because you have a top-down approach, an investigator won't be scared of saying, okay, body structure here, I want to look at clinical findings, then here, calculus finding, you see that the number of patients and document decrease automatically. And then you have here, bilirubin calculus. This ontology and all this was populated automatically. I just put the 465 PDF in one folder and then all this, there's a script automatically generated that we are happy, of course, to, uh, to, uh, to release to the open source community, definitely, but you need to have I2B2 installed to have, otherwise you won't be able to use the modifiers. And so w using this Bailey's calculus, where there's, the system is telling me that this patient count equals three out of four documents, will I trust this? I'm an epidemiologist by training, 
I will never trust this. I will never trust natural language processing without seeing the sentence. The huge difference is now in 2015, NLP is good enough to project everything into this kind of representation with no validation of all of it, and then to make the validation on the fly based on your interest. So very selfishly, you will only validate the outcome and covariance of interest for your study. By clicking here, you have a pop-up window that will show you four documents. One, two, three, four. The four documents related that were automatically extracted. So you can see that the synonyms are automatically linked. Galston's, collector essays, Sibylle Calculus, three medical synonyms. And then it, the system is telling me that she had Galston. It's automatically checked. This one, no collector essays. It's automatically unchecked. This one is checked. And this one, she has Garson in the patient sister history. Oh, no, I don't agree with this one. You can see that patient count here equals three, because you can see that one, two, and three. I don't agree. I click here, and then you'll see that patient count equals three will become two after clicking here on apply validation. We are doing a real-time update within the database, because at this time of validation, an investigator will never allow to wait one day to have the full ETL being rerun. He wants to be able to test it and use it straight away. So what we did and worked you to be able to do partitioning, to make sure that the indexing and all the, to be able to be scalable so that when you change the database, you can still use it because that's a, a, a very a big concern when you integrate all this data. And you have here, now patient count equals two. So I can run my statistical analysis that was validated. And this is higher quality than a registry data because I saw the data where it came from. And using the modifiers, how did we store the data? We didn't change the I2B2 model to do this. We used the modifiers, which under every single concept, you have those modifiers that add additional functionality around this concept. That's where we store the status of the validation in those concepts, in those modifiers. If I want, by default, when I drag and drop, I'll only take the positive sentence. But if I want, I can, in the context of a clinical trial, I can be interested of all the patients where it's written that they do not have any barriers calculus, which you can do with ICD code. But here, by selecting this one, I can select only the patient that are negative. So by default, it will only take the positive one. So it's really about, and you, it's the same when you have drug prescription. Drug prescription is not, is the route, the dose, the time that can be integrated with all those different modifiers when we integrate the drug. That's why they were created within the I2B2 model. We didn't create anything. This was used and, de and described and used in production by I2B2 for a long time. So looking now at the kind of analysis that we went conduct using all this data, we were interested to see and identify all the phenotypes that are linked to other genes that were upfront of shank free because we couldn't make the difference between the genes that are related to phenotypes up front of shank free because they all have shank free deleted. So what we did is to integrate the data into here I2B2 Transmart. So this is the error number one of we integrated the data with the natural language processing, which is a number one step that we integrated. Then number two is all the data was integrated. And number three, to create analytic statistical analytic tool using R on the data that was integrated using multiple regression model and to do the harmonized coordinates between the geno geno genotypic location. So that's one of the main uh, outcome of our study is the genetic deletion per patient, one line per patient, and you have here the phenotypic data, which in gray means it's present, in and if it's um, in light, it means it's absent. So for example, the first patient have a deletion, a huge deletion, and they have vesicle re uh, reflux, but they don't have polycystic kidneys. Using different statistical method, we were able to discover the different phenotypes that are linked to a gene which is upfront of the uh, of shang free and this only by having the f creating the f step number three of analyzing the data to be able to because all the data was already integrated into one central place then 
the uh, something extremely important is the open source aspect. And we did a review in briefings in bioinformatics of all the publicly available solutions that enable the integration of all the clinical data and omics data. And we did it with Bastien, who's also in the room from uh, Pompidou Hospital, to look at, at the time, there were seven of them in 2012, where they, when we contacted them, and to be able, can we have access to the tool? Can we have access to the source code? And the best one is with no surprise I2B2 Transmart, and there's multiple reasons, but one of those reasons is because of handling the complex phenotypic data which link to the genotypic data. Other platform will only recognize the phenotypic data as being cases versus control, but can't integrate real life data. That's how it makes the difference. And then something that was extremely important and missing is the fact that I2B2 code wasn't playing the game. At, it wasn't open source fully as it wasn't available on GitHub. And so now on November 14th, the, on the I2B2 repository, it will be fully uh, uh, available and accepting the uh, comments to be able to be part of the community in order to make a huge step to make the link with the Transmart uh, Foundation community. So that's, it was really hard. <laughs> and something amazing, at the I2B2 community meeting, European one two weeks ago in in UK, 25 presentation, a quarter of them were about Transmart. So, and people were presenting Transmart, even the version 1.2, where there's no I2B2 anymore, and they were saying some of the functionality don't work like in I2B2. Yes, well, there's not there's not I2B2, but they, and they were they were presenting it with the title I2B2 and using Transmart. So, what's really important is the fact that those two community should join and we definitely should have joined meetings because there's a, a, a huge, there's no way of reinventing things that already worked uh, and to not, it's not which one is going to uh, to capture the second one, no, it's both will leave, the I2B2 foundation community, the uh, Transmart foundation community and but working together this will make a huge difference. Now in the context of scalability, something extremely important is the fact of having the number of patients and the number of users being integrated in such platform. Where today I2B2 is in production in more than 120 university hospitals with all the EHR data that was integrated. And one of the reasons why Transmart was created by Recombinance and Johnson & Johnson at the time, eight, eight years ago now, was because things were lacking within I2B2 and that's what to have the statistical tool, to be able to have all the detailed process to load the data and to load the omics data. But having two, the, those two systems, the I2B2, to do the advanced score selection, uh, enables to have Transmart for, as an advanced statistical tool, Biobank Explorer, Event Explorer, and then to have all your data integrated and compatible with other networks that already exist, where there's also a community of Shrine. Shrine is multiple I2B2 installation in the world that communicate to already together to be able to access the data from those multiple institutions. There are eight Shrine networks in production. The first one is between five univers uh, university hospitals around Harvard. And to be able to integrate, so if you start looking within I2B2, you are part of this network and we were able to communicate, to use Shrine directly using our I2B2 Transmart with no line of code, no changes. It worked directly out of the box. It was more painful for me to install Shrine in Popido Hospital three years ago than it was to make the link with Transmart, which I wouldn't think this would happen. But it's really using the same tools and not reinventing. And then you'll be also compatible with another set of tools called Smart, where there's Smart on Fire. When you want to have patient level data lookup in your EHR system, this works today in production. Cerno, Epic have a Smart container. So you can have within your patient in front of you, you can have information that you stored within Transmart being available using this Smart container. So Please look at those functionalities that already exist. There's a huge community. There's a smart community. There's an I2B2 community, which are very close. But the Transmart community, there's really not much link today. So really, it's a question of look what already exists. 
Now in the context of scalability, reliance, and reliability and compliance, the fact on going on the cloud. So many institutions go on the cloud because they don't want to handle this in their house, and they really want to make sure to be able to have this scalability that prepares on the infrastructure Amazon. But something that was extremely important for us to go forward when we have patient data is trust from the institution, from the, uh, from the, um, the funding agency. So we had to be HIPAA compliant. HIPAA is a US law to protect the confidentiality and security of healthcare information. And so we went through an old process. It took us nine months to get through this to now be able and allow to store PHR data by PHR protected health information, which are name, personal, email, all this kind of information on the Amazon cloud at Harvard Medical School, where we were using I2B2 Transmart. So this was a huge success to be able to now be able to store this PHI data, all the clinical notes of patients within Amazon by securing the full infrastructure. Because it's, we couldn't just put I2B2 Transmart on the cloud, we had to secure it. We had to change all the configuration, all the security layers to be able to, uh, to go through all the different audits. The different security level that exist at Harvard, there's five level. Level five, there's only one study in all Harvard history, so since 16,000, where there's one study at level five. Level five means if the, there's a security breach within the study, then the individual which is included in the study goes to jail. And this only study is on non, on, uh, on, um, uh, non, uh, uh, on immigrant non allowed to get in the United States. So illegal aliens that managed to get through the border, they got included in a study. I don't know how they found them. But, and they are in a computer. So the data is present today in a computer which has no connection to whatsoever. Not the internet, no USB. You are not allowed to make any screen scores. So this study is run at Harvard into a locked room. That's level five. We don't need that. <laughs> we need, we, and we got the approval for level four of very sensitive information with all the PHI data on Amazon and all this infrastructure. How did we manage to do this? So that's the very high level on how we did it is to first have a business associated agreement with Harvard between the institution and Amazon to share the responsibility of wh wh who do what. And then what did we have to do on the art side is to have the, and what's interesting is on their side, they do a lot of things like they, they, you have to name the name, the account number of Amazon. So they add additional security layer on top of it. They add a, an additional audit trail and they do report uh, monthly and annually of what was happening and what did we have to do on our side. We needed to have dedicated instance on Amazon. So it's a question of choosing an option, but this option is 17K per year per account. When we discovered this, where I have today four projects on, four research projects on Amazon, so I had four different accounts. When we discovered this because it's per account, so we put everything into one account. And like that, I only pay once the fee of $17,000. And we worked with Amazon team to do this, to help us. And so we created virtual private cloud, which are completely separated environment on this unique account, where to be able to get in the account, you need to be on the IB that for this study. Then something extremely important is to encrypt everything, to be able to encrypt at all the data at state and in transit. And something that is not obvious is you need to encrypt it before sending the data. You can't just use the encryption mechanism in Amazon because then the first you can you have a security breach within when you send the data, which wasn't very clear. And then, which also was quite surprising, the Amazon staff, the developers that are creating the infrastructure, will never have access inside an EC2. It's impossible, <laughs> technically, by the SSH key and all this. But what they can do for a very limited number of individuals they can have access to US free bucket. What a surprise when you have PHI data. So you need to encrypt everything, and that's one of the reasons. So that you have to, to be really careful of what you can do. And the key point was to do audit everything. 
from the deployment of the infrastructure on Amazon, the application on everything had to be logged and audited, the user, and the ETL process. In-house, we have five tools to load data. We use, like everyone, the Kettle one, but there's the issue of scalability. And But the pros of this one, compared to all the other ones that we have created for different study, it's the one that has the best audit log today. On this one, and I'm just looking, and I tested all of them, TM Batch, TM uh, Loader, and others, the issue is you don't have an audit log which is with the Kettle script a quarter of the code. And thanks to John Lee and the recommended team at the time to create this, a quarter of the code is dedicated on the audit trail to prove how the data was in. If we didn't have that, we couldn't have this compliance. It's this real audit log of everything that is integrated. So that it's not a black box, it's a transparent box. And then we, cre we created a continuous development infrastructure and deployment on Amazon, starting from GitHub, where we have a DevOps code and the secret to have everything being integrated and how to, to have this compliance is to have non-human involved in the installation. So the, to have, of course, all the I2B2 Transmart application code being present on GitHub as the starting point to do your Bamboo development and then with a S3 artifact to do the installation, the database using LiquidBase, but most important is the DevOps code on how do you create from a blank Amazon account all the installations so that you don't have a human involved and that's a key point. And so we have this uh, scalability and the um, uh, uh, continuous development for the developers. And finishing on the big data aspect, we have at the patient, uh, one of the uh, NIH project, patient-centric information commons, where we created a restful API with the sessions on accessing the data, for not just one at a time, so, but you have a real session to be able to increase the complexity of your query the same way I2B2 does it today from the user interface with the modifiers, with the time relation from a RESTful API and to be able to access the data staying where it was generated. And that's what we do for this project. We're also looking at Amazon Redshift with an Amazon grant and their help to look at the scalability of this infrastructure with the I2B2 database model, but also on other database model for NGS to see how, look at the scalability. And to finish, wanted to show you a, a NIH project where looking at the number with the mental health, the issue is you can't do a biopsy of the brain. So to see like in cancer, when we in cancer, now precision medicine, you do a biopsy and then you can do to test multiple drugs on the cells on this patient. You can't do this with mental health. We have a project where we do a skin biopsy of 500 individuals. Then we to get the fibroblast that we call to and we transform back to stem cells. So to go back as it was, it was the pretty important stem cells and to go back to have neurons in a dish. Within these neurons in a dish, we then test 10,000 drugs systematically to see what the different response and so the, the phenotype that will come from this study on the cells is really different like they don't they won't have autism but they have for example you can test elements out of this phenotype and on the phenotype side what we want to integrate also is not just the phenotype but to and that's the RDOC initiative to go back and do the re, a new classification of disease, to look at for the fear, the anxiety, the threat, to look at the gene involved, the molecule. So that's another way of integrating all your data together. And within this project, we do, we're doing 500 subjects with all genome, not exome, all genome sequencing using I2B2 Transmart as the integrated platform to integrate all of your data together. And my last slide is on the link between three different university pediatric hospital and now it's the big data on free access. An incredible amount of patients, all the EHR on those patients, of the viable and the time from those free institution. The first baby step that, was, that started a month ago for one year is to have three different installation on Amazon with an HIPAA compliant to use I2B2 Transmart as an on-demand application to be able to integrate your data and to run analysis between all those different elements. And to finish, 
we also looking at, uh, at the NCAT Red Disease Global Registry Program at uh, the NIH to integrate all the red disease registry. So in this case, we don't have a lot of patients, but we have very precious data that wasn't available for those patients. And so to finish, it's really about how to integrate and make sure that all those different steps are fully transparent from the integration, the different kind of analysis, the infrastructure, so you'll have the trust of everyone using this infrastructure. Thank you very much. That was great, Paul. <clears throat> Whenever you show this, I'm just so incredibly impressed. Um, yeah, well, it's like, what are we doing here? Let's just give everything to Paul. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it, no, what no, you're no. pointing out is, is a, you know, the, one of the lessons I take away from this is, as a scientist, you know, you're really focusing on the science you can accomplish with technology, and then really thinking practically about what technology do I need to solve the problem. And it's very clear the role that Transmart plays in there, but also the things that one needs to do to Transmart to enable the kind of work you're doing. Uh, that's incredibly impressive. So I, I really appreciate you, you showing this to us. Thank you. Um, I see it's, it's time for us to run into dinner. Uh, I know we probably have a thousand questions. Um, what I would suggest is that we ask Paul those questions over dinner. Uh, we have a lot of time for conversation. Uh,